Hello, and welcome to RHDS Music. My name is Rob Hart. Please check me out at my website at robhartdrumstudio.com, and there you can sign up for free lesson previews, and you can sign up for my mailing list to get the latest information when it drops. What I've done here is I've compiled a series of different interviews I've done with music professionals, and I hope you get a lot out of these different interviews, and I know I've learned a lot, so please enjoy. Hello, we're here with Carl Thompson, um, a great drummer, uh, entrepreneur, and uh, musician. Uh, thank you, Carl, for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, first off, uh, where did you grow up? I uh, grew up in a small town in the northeast of England called Newton Aycliffe. Okay. And uh, when did you first get into music? Uh, I got into music. I initially wanted to play the guitar and couldn't really get my hands around the guitar. And I remember seeing the drums. And one day someone said, right, you go on the drums this week. And then next week you can go on the guitar. And I sat down on the drums. And I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. Didn't really know much about the drums. And they showed me like a little beat. And then... Then the following week, I went on the guitar and was just like, ah, this just feels really awkward. And, and then I just swapped with a friend and was like, that was it. And I just sat down and pretty much from that moment, I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. Like, it was pretty instant, which was quite surprising. Um, so how old were you when you started? I was about 11 or 12. It was, yeah, it was about in between. I was, it was the summer of god i can't remember 94 i think it was just after that and uh i turned 12 in the november and went from there and what music were you guys listening to what was your influences did you have uh family members that were playing music in the house brothers sisters uh, uh parents yeah so i actually my my parents are both dance teachers ballroom and latin and we actually had a dance school attached to the side of the house. So I would always hear all this swing dance music and, you know, jives, foxtrots, quick steps, the, the whole thing. And it wasn't really that type of stuff that I played, but I was always around music. And then, you know, at that time, it was the birth of Britpop. So we had the likes of Oasis, Blur, Pulp, um, and, and then... All of my friends, a lot of my friends weren't even musicians, so they were into anything from electronic dance music to standard pop music and the Black Eyed Peas and, and whoever that was around at that time, you know, like late 90s. And so I remember the first song that I wanted to play that really made me want, like, I already had the drums and I was just listening to the radio and it was Oasis's uh, Don't Look Back in Anger. And I remember that was one of the first things that I wanted to just sit down and play with. So, Did you guys have, um, did you go out and buy a kit? Did you have music, uh, uh, almost like a um, band room or something, or a place to, to practice? Uh, yeah, when you were yeah. Was that allowed in the house? I don't know what it was like in, in, in England, like, uh, yeah. but it could be noisy and sometimes... Um, you know, parents buying drum sets, uh, like you had to play, like I had to play in the garage, you know, first it was my bedroom, then the garage. Did you have anything like that? I, I, I had very, my parents are great and we, I just had them in my bedroom, you know, it was, uh, we started off with a little small junior kit, which was, I think like a 16 inch bass drum, one rack tom and a little splash cymbal. And then after I'd played that for, you know, two or three months they were like okay we see that this is something you you know you need a bigger kit and we went we like this i think it was a percussion plus it was a very basic drum kit but had the five piece kit the crash the ride and the hyatt and and they were really supportive and and we were in a detached house so we we didn't have any neighbors close by the only thing i remember that i had to do is make sure i kept the window closed so we were we were we were pretty lucky in that respect, you know. Yeah, great. Um, did you have mentors, uh, people that you took lessons from, or 
Um, did you have any um, anybody that influenced you um, that 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 um, encouraged you growing up? Anything like that? What I call musical mentors or otherwise? Yeah. Um, so I'd started learning like late late ninety four. I got a Christmas present of a drum kit, and then. It was around the January or the February, my parents were like, right, we've got you a drum teacher. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was kind of, I was really scared because I was like, I, I, you know, I was only 11. I was like, I don't want to, I don't know, I just want to play the drums, you know. And I was a bit nervous. and But then I remember meeting my, my drum teacher. It was a guy called Stu Yellerton. And he was a phenomenal drummer, very, you know, technical and great player. You know, kind of in the same vein of like Dave Weckl and and that kind of era, and wonderful player, great teacher, and I had lessons with him for six, seven years, pretty much. You know, just straight through all through college and university as well. You know, I stayed at home for university, um, and he was my my main drum teacher. And then, you know, at school we did have when we went to college, we had a we had a drum teacher there. Um, but then my, even just my high school, you know, my comprehensive school music teacher was a guy called Pete Simpson. He was phenomenal, really enthusiastic. He was a guitar teacher and I got involved in most of the bands at school and we used to do musicals every year and I was always a drummer in the, in the band for that. And, you know, I just had a great, yeah, I would say I had a lot of mentors just, you know, who, who just really encouraged me. It was it was nice to have that, you know. Yeah, that's um, kind of going into my next question about the school music program. Um, so did you do, did you have, is there a lot of classical music at your school? Did you do symphonic, concert band, and then jazz band, marching band, rock band, or pit orchestra? Did you have yeah. those kind of activities? And, yeah, so we... When I started in my secondary school, which, uh, I, it's hard to know because I know that English schools and American schools are different, but it's around 11 years old and we just got a new music teacher and it was, so I'd started the school, he just started the school and the music department was fairly small and he was, as I say, he was a guitarist, kind of primarily doing like rock and roll, you know, pop stuff. And um, when we... In the curriculum at that school, in the high school, was always um, cl mainly classical. And then he brought the pop and the jazz influence into it, and and um, and and that's kind of where we stuck. And with with the regards to bands, we we had a jazz band, and I actually started playing trumpet for that. And the teacher that I had, I didn't really like the teacher, and I and it just didn't stick with me, you know, and I, and I think that's one thing about teachers. It, if you get a bad teacher or you get a good teacher, it makes or breaks the difference, you know, between whether you'll continue on. Um, so, so yeah, I played in the jazz bands. I had some band outside of school, which is like a garage band, you know, we, we a couple of friends. Um, we didn't really have the drumline thing wasn't a thing in England. It wasn't. It's not very popular, which is a shame because I love I love seeing it here. I think it's the guys are so disciplined. It's it's a full regime and it's it's phenomenal. Uh, but we didn't have that, so I played in some jazz bands, uh, the jazz band at school, and then as I said, the musicals we used to do every year, and then any type of performance the the teacher would always put on every now and again. He put together a little band and we'd perform at, at a lunchtime, you know, on the stage. And and he always involved me and and that was that. And then my, my drum teacher, when I got to about 16, 15, 16, he would, he would put me forward for certain gigs, you know, within the music service. So he would say, right, there's a gig coming up here. I think you can do, I, I can't do it. So you, you fill in for me and... You know, it was just a basic thing, playing for some school somewhere else. And and then once that left school, um, I, well, once I left school and went to, like, college and university, it was a different ball game. Um, I, I went straight to a, a, 
a, a college in Newcastle, and it was just a primarily just a music course. It was a it was what we called a, was a diploma in music. The, the the first two years, which I believe is your high school, but it's our college, is uh, it was two years of music, and it was just five days a week music. And I remember getting into the, one of the first classes and they just put you into groups and bands. I'm sure it's very similar to like Berkeley. And they, the lecturer was like, all right, here's the music, blah, 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 and just handed out the music to everybody. And my drum teacher had always taught me to read and, and I'd been reading in the jazz band, but it was just different, you know. And I remember just sitting down and the, the, the band leader went, okay, there you go. I didn't even... We hadn't even introduced ourselves. He just put the music down. I was like, right, one, two. And I was like, oh. And I was like, oh, this needs to happen. I was like, you know. And and luckily, I was good at kind of like fluffing my way through stuff. And, and it was in a genre which was fine for me, so I, I did well. But I remember going home that night and going, I need to get my old books out and start like, <laughs> you know, brushing up. And, and I did. And. And this, the, moving on to university, there was no, like, music music course band. It was just you were put into groups and you made your own groups. And and from there, you'd form groups with your friends. And we'd go out on weekends and do gigs and, you know, do a little jazz quartet gig or we'll do a, a wedding. And, and that was kind of, you know, our thing. So... Um in jazz band, were you um, playing arrangements, sending up the band, and 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 um, kind of getting that thing? Because this is kind of what happened to me. Our our jazz when we were in what we call middle school, which is like seventh and eighth grade. Uh, mm -hmm. You're for thirteen. You're thirteen, twelve, thirteen, something around there. Yeah. Um, he didn't make us read music, even right. though I was, I was taking lessons and. And, and could read rhythms or uh, getting into doing that and doing in rudimental and class. We did kind of classical and then uh, independence and whatnot. Uh, but we never learned about like reading drum charts. So what happened is um, uh, when we got into high school and it, it was hard to get into the jazz band. You had to, it took like I was a junior, my third year of high school to get in uh, and the band was smoking. Yeah, uh, they were smoking, and and the 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 teacher actually taught John Patitucci, who was a bass player, what? and so he was a great great band teacher, but you couldn't get in. It was really really hard, really com competitive, and only you know the guy that was in there was amazing. Um, so then you know we went from this thing of like kind of not really having to read, and then you know thrown into the situation of reading drum charts and not knowing how to interpret it. Nobody could read really that way. You know, yeah. people could kind of read, you know, uh, rhythms and, and, and whatnot, because it's a different kind of reading that you're doing, but this is like interpreting what's going to happen before it happens, you know, setting up the band, uh, yeah. lear learning what a form was like play 32 bars. I go, I'm counting one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. two. It's like, what does that mean? You know, nobody told us anything. And then um, the the charts were from like North Texas State, Buddy Rich, Louis Belson. You know, it was just insane, insane stuff. You know that that went from like you know A to Z. You know, in a moment. So I actually that was something that I started practicing a lot because um i i couldn't i didn't even know what to do you know we were never taught about that taking the coda going you know like going to the ds like the roadmap um yeah. you know the solo sections and all these things um you know keeping time <laughs> yeah nobody could you know people were like slowing down speeding up and like yeah. yelling come on you know you get yelled <laughs> so and and our uh jazz band was before school so it was like um you know, we it'd be at seven in the morning, so you'd have to get up. And of course, we're in competition, so we'd get up at six. I don't even remember this being a problem. Who could get there first? And we'd get there before the teacher would show up. So I'd be waiting outside and waiting for him to open the doors. Right? Wow. So it was it was kind of um, a little bit like that movie. Uh, um, what is that one called? Whiplash. A little bit like that, except not. 
not just the teacher, uh, but the um, but the students. Right. You know, yelling and, and kind of people were like, just, you know, they're mean, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, our jazz bands were, you know, were not that. Um, we were... In, in in schools, they were very tame, and you you know the Americans would probably laugh at the state of the jazz bands in 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 our schools. But outside of the school, you would go to like a, a county band, and then you'd have the Northern Youth Youth Jazz Orchestra. And I wasn't a part of that; I didn't really follow that path. But my I, I remember my drum teacher was, and that was his. You know, he went on to play with the Northern Youth Jazz Orchestra, and then the keyboard player was. Was uh, ended up being Madonna's keyboard player down the line and gone on to be and another sax player was he writes number one hits in the UK now. Um, but most of the most of the kind of inner school bands are, are not fantastic and and you have very basic charts, but like you said, nothing was kind of explained to you. My drum teacher was really good at explaining that type of stuff because. You had to, and then when we went to university, that's when it kind of, it was that type of thing, right? Yeah, you've got to be, right, give us 32 bars, this, that, and the other, set up the band, and and I was somewhat prepared with that, as I said, but it, you know, I just had to brush up on it. My whiplash moment, though, was um, when I was 17, I think it was, and I, in the northeast of England, or throughout England, you have these brass bands, and it's kind of a different brass band to, you know, the the thing that you see in um, where oh god, where is it at? Down in the south, uh, Louisiana. That way, I'm getting this wrong. Anyway, so where your American brass bands, and you know, it's it's really like a carnival. This was all based around um, pit mining villages. So where the, when the coal pits were and people would mine all the coal they would have these brass bands and over the years as the coal mining has gone down the brass bands have kind of stayed as a community thing and and throughout the the country there's many brass bands and then they'll do they'll go to competitions and they'll just they'll all perform the same piece and they get judged on how well they performed it and if they had so much dynamic in it and the emotion that they created in it even though they're playing all the same song and I remember my drum teacher put me forward for this brass band and and it was a thing of like, okay, you're just playing snare drum or you might be playing snare drum and timpani and it's kind of like the orchestral thing but the music isn't as cool in my opinion. And and I remember I joined this band and it was fine and then the I think the first or the second one, my drum teacher came up with me and he was awesome and he could read this stuff and they had a guest... He had a guest conductor who was leading them to to prepare for this competition. And my drum teacher like, just showed me and blitzed through this piece. And I was like, oh, my God, I don't know if I can do this. And he, and he helped me through it, and I got through it. But I remember being in, like, the following weeks after that and just struggling. And the band leader was just, like, like on you. Like, come on, what are you like? And I'm like, you know, and it, it kind of helped me in it. In a roundabout way, because you, you just you didn't want to be that person, you just panicked. And, and I remember watching Whiplash, and all these all these emotions came flooding back to me from that time. Going, oh my god, like I don't want to go in that again. <laughs> but that was that was one of my moments, and I remember we actually won that competition that year. So I was, you know, he was he was a brilliant conductor and he and he the band leader he brought us all together but it was definitely scary you know i i had one of those guys at berkeley actually um because you know here was like i i grew up reading music and doing um you know formal training and everything but it was like trying to put together like the sight reading yeah. and he started yelling at me read the chart and <laughs> You know, and we're this Berkeley's and and Boston East Coast. East Coast is a different vibe than than you know West Coast, yeah. so it's a little bit more you know like in your face. Yeah, 
And so he started yelling at me, but you know what? Like you, it kind of helped me like, Oh, you know, Oh, oh okay. Yeah. And then I started, it like clicked. Like I started getting this stuff and I got way better, you know, at doing it, but we were doing like 24 seven. It was always stuff was involved with reading. Cause we had to do harmony, arranging, ear training, uh, you know, uh, um, in all our labs and everything that we did, there was always rhythms and different things involved. So, you know, things start clicking when you're just doing it all the time yeah. and it's kind of what i tell my students about the repetition because i could the math stuff like quick you know like math okay this does this equals this and this this yeah. is, and and it, like i could get that real quickly but when you yeah. start seeing it over and over and over again then you start going oh i've seen this before yeah and that that's when it started to get easier because i started to see um what i call shapes because i'm a shape guy i i see shapes and patterns yeah. And I go, oh, there's that pattern again. There's that shape again. Okay, I'm recognizing it. And then I got way better. But I do got to hand it to that guy that started yelling at me, you know, yeah. uh, that time. When I was in high school, it was just, um, they didn't explain anything. And then, you know, they kind of didn't, they didn't, there was no baby steps. It was just they threw you into the deep end, you know. And um, we'd have tapes, you know, we used to have cassette tapes. And you try to just practice with the tape. And there'd be some flip around because there'd be some kind of weird it would be um, uh, some kind of groove that you didn't know where one was, you know, yeah. something like that. So you just kept flipping the time. You you didn't quite know where one was. And they go, well, dude, you're off. You're off. You know, they just. You know. <laughs> so, you know, that that was the thing about that. So, you know, um, some of those guys that do what went to that kind of almost scary moment, the, the whiplash moment actually yeah. helped in a way. Because it, it made you kind of wake up and, and, and go, I got to do this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Um, so when you were um, taking these lessons and you were doing all this musical stuff, were you? did you have a practice routine that you're doing? Did you practice? Like I was telling you, I, I did this eight hours a day at one time when I was in high school just because, you know, I – it was all this stuff going on and, 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 and I, I didn't want that to happen. So uh, I wanted to be better. I wanted to accomplish like playing these really hard charts. Yeah. Um, did you have a, a, a time in your life where you practicing a certain amount with your lessons? Did you have like a, a daily routine you did um, that, that you, you had a, a, a certain amount of hours or time that you're practicing or, or uh, a certain amount of times a week you're practicing? Right. Yeah. I mean, when I first started playing, it was just all fun, and I played for fun. And it, I was generally playing or practicing at least an hour a day. You know, I was I just come home from school, and it's what I want to do. I just wanted to play. And primarily for me, my practice, I would practice what my drum teacher would give me, which was he was a very big proponent of playing along to tracks, and he did, we used to have this book called. Oh, a graded course for drum kit and it was by a guy called Dave Hassel and he was used to teach at a school in Manchester and it was just one of the first play along books for without drums and there'd be a chart and you, but like a proper chart is in like you'd have an indicated groove a bunch of repeated bars and then fill or then you'd have a phrase that you had to hit <laughs> so it's he would work me through those. We do a few bits of rudiments, but primarily I used to just put on my favorite CDs or the radio and just play along for, for hours on end. And um, when I went to, to college and university, you know, we had different things we had to learn and practice. And But I was never one of these people who would sit down for eight hours and just blitz rudiments. And as, you know, it probably went against me, but... It just wasn't me, you know. I it just it really did bore me to do <laughs> that. I I enjoyed playing with people, and that was my my thing. So what we do at school is we'd have we'd book out one of the studios, and a bunch of us would just get together and just play and jam and learn a tune. And and the good thing with school is eventually we 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 were put into bands like I said, and we had to prepare for a performance. So that would be our kind of band practice. And obviously at home, you'd go home and you'd practice the part before you get there. And But I was never one of these people who would just practice rudiments constantly, not until later on in life, you know. Um, 
probably to like mid early 20s, sorry, I would say, just after we'd finished university, I, I started to get into it and I was like, okay. So I would do, I'd set aside, you know, I was working, I was teaching a lot, I was playing in many bands and so the, the, the playing along to music was kind of taken care of because I was gigging two and three times a week um, in these show bands and then we, so then I'd sit down for maybe two hours twice, three times a week and I'd do an hour with just rudiments and then an hour of 30 minutes applying those rudiments around the kit and then I'd just put on a, a track like a Dave Weckl song or Thomas Lang or some some type of something with a bit of grit to it and and just have fun with it and try and add some of the stuff I'd just done into the into the thing, you know. So that so that was kind of my the majority of my practice. But then when I moved to LA it I had a lockout space for a, a short period of time and, and it was fun and but most of the time it was I was just trying to play gig rehearse with people or do sessions and that kind of took off my life as it inevitably does you know so um my next question is about that uh, starting to do musical projects and recordings um can you talk about that like your your musical projects were you gigging in england and and um what what kinds of things were you doing yeah you guys play like i don't know um I guess did you did you guys have gigs that you would make uh, like doing uh, what we call freelance or did you have like bands that you would do that we we called it like pop we called it top forty um, but it it would mean that you play in clubs and you do a circuit of clubs and then the band yeah. would make a it would do like a um, you know you would make you would make a certain amount every night in the band so it would be like a, a job did you guys yeah do like that. Yeah, so in the in the primarily the northeast of England, we would have what we called a working men's club, and that was again back to these pit mining days where a, a pit mine would be would be kind of solidified, and then they build some houses around there for the workers to live in, and then they'd have this social club, and the social club it was it was kind of it was very old school, and it was primarily just for the men. So you'd have these, it was just men-only kind of rooms, and then they'd have a communal room where the, the wives were allowed in. It was really weird. So, but over the years, they, they kind of stayed, they opened up to be more, you know, anybody could come in. It wasn't just for the pit mining because the pits had closed. Um, but it was still, these communities were still there. So they were, so every every weekend, and there's there's hundreds of thousands of these, like just hundreds and thousands of these clubs in the northeast and and some to the Midlands, these clubs. And what they would do is every weekend they'd have what they called a turn on, and the band is the turn. So the bands would come in and perform, and and it was generally top forty stuff, but you'd play anything from the seventies right the way through to the modern day, because at that time in the the 90s and the 2000s you'd have you'd have their daughters coming in you'd have you know the so you'd have every generation pretty much coming through the doors because the alcohol was very cheap in the in the clubs um so we would do those that was kind of where you know the whole band would turn up you'd have your own pa system you'd have your own sound guy you'd have lights you'd bring in the whole show and they were very popular throughout the northeast and in the midlands and still are to a degree you know they're still going um but then aside from that we would do a lot of weddings in different bands and that would be more freelance you know you just get called like hey we need a sub or a, what we would call a dep the dep is our form of a sub so deputy got a dep coming in so you'd go on dep for your friends and you know there'd be charts there and and then we do like the sort of the cocktail bands which would play for the weddings in the in the reception and then um but then recording there was always you know 
like there are like there is in LA, there's the original band circuit and the original artist circuit. And I used to play with quite a few few of those guys. Um, and we did some good tours. We I don't know if you know a guy called Jules Holland. He had a TV show called Later, and he was part of Squeeze, the band Squeeze. So he had this TV show in England, and I think he still does. And you get bands from all around the world would come on and do performances, and all live. It was brilliant. But he would he also had this big band of like some of the top players in the UK. But everybody would go and see him. So with a few of the bands that we used to play with, a few of the artists, we'd go and support him on his big arena tours, and um. And it was kind of fun, you know. We we just did a bit of everything, like like people do here. You'd have the pop gig, you'd go and do the clubs, then you'd you know you'd play someone's wedding, then you'd do the original thing and recording. And I did quite a lot of recording at, at a at one studio called Loft. We used to do quite a few different artists and projects there. Some of it was electronic as well. So I had a friend who did very well with his electronic uh, band. And he was he went through a few different names. One was Spectre, and it was electronic music, but he had a live drummer, and that was me. And, and we'd do recordings of live drums as well as do, you know, go down to London and to the UK doing different things. So, yeah, there was it was a full breadth of things. I, didn't, I never wanted to kind of get stuck in one band particularly and just do one thing. I always wanted to be the session player, and so I had the variety to play with many different people. And my drum teacher was kind of instrumental in that, in the respect he would just, what gigs he, when I got to a certain age of 18, 19, and gigs he couldn't do, I'd get thrown gigs his way, uh, my way from him, and, you know, and that really helped me solidify a bit of a playing career, you know. Wow, so it sounds like you were... Um you were doing a lot there. There's a lot of, of work happening. Yeah, there was. Yeah, there was there was quite a lot of work. And I did teach, you know, after I after I finished university, I actually went I I got a random gig through my drum teacher to play in India. And I was playing had Latin percussion in a nightclub. That was one of the big things that we used to do in the UK. They would have a DJ playing in the corner and then you'd have a percussionist. And, you know, it was a bit of a gimmick, but it added something to the music and it was a bit of a spectacle at, at, at these nightclubs. And I ended up going to India for two or three months and playing in one of their big nightclubs out there. And when I came back, I was doing kind of the same thing in England, but then I also picked up a teaching gig in a private school and was doing that, you know, started off just a couple of days a week and then that built up to about five days a week during the day. So then I would split my time during the day I was teaching, then on on most evenings I was either rehearsing, recording, or performing. So it was good, you know. It was it was a fun time. So um, uh, the university, um, how long did you go? Um, did you was it a four year? Did you take music courses at the university? Or yeah. What, what was your what was your? We have what we call majors here. I don't know if they call yeah. it major or what was your. Uh, what were you studying? Right. So the way it worked in England was you would just choose, um, which is pretty similar to you, you'd choose one subject and it was music. And my the, the degree music course that I did was a Bachelor of Music in Jazz, Popular and Commercial. So which basically just covers everything, barring classical. And... Um, it was a three-year degree. I didn't go on to do a master's because it just... It wasn't needed for me at that time. And in the three years, you would, the first two years, you're kind of doing a bit of everything. You'd, you'd, you'd have your keyboard skills class, you'd have your bands, you'd have your individual drum lessons, you'd have your theory classes, you'd have your music, musicology, music technology, your recording. And then in the last year, you would choose a major and minor kind of study but you still did a bit of everything so my major was my major in performance and I minored in production so I really enjoyed the studio side of things and we had to record I think it was like 20 or 30 minutes of music 
on the minor side and then the performance side we just had to we had to put together a band we had to put together a repertoire and do a gig and that was it really and it was and it was fun because that was that third year was the I practiced the most in my life I think you know I would have two or three rehearsals a week with my band you know over the course of a year which we only had to learn six songs but we just dialed it in so much and we were really tight and it was probably the best I was ever playing at that time you know um and it was fun you know you got to pick your the tunes you wanted to do and you'd you'd consult with the lecturers and you'd be like this is what I'm thinking you know and they were like well, everything's in, you know, some of it's in four. Have you got anything in di- odd time? So you're just like, yeah, okay, well, so we did. I remember we did Tom Scott looking out from number seven, or lucky seven, number seven. And it was Tom Scott, the sax player. I don't know if you, you know, oh, yeah. he wasn't very well known in the UK, but he was a drum teacher. My drum teacher, Roger, suggested it, and it was, and I was like, okay. And it was great. And I think it was actually a TV theme show at one point. I don't know. But, yeah, it was a bizarre seven. It went from seven into four into five or something. And, and that kind of scratched that itch. And, but, yeah, that was that was my main, my major performance in minor production. But it was fun. So at that point, did you, um, did you uh, have a dream to come to uh, L.A. Um, or come to the States? Did, did, was that your dream of hey I'm gonna do I'm gonna go over there and and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna get into uh, maybe getting a touring situation um, trying to 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 network uh, try to get into studio work be a, a a studio musician did you have that dream um, at that point when you were um, uh, you got out of university did you want to come over to the United States and 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 uh, be a, a working musician? No, I mean, not really, to be honest. I, I always wanted to be a session musician. I always wanted to to do recording and, and you know, be that. But I never, I was just very naive at a younger age, you know. I was, and, and I remember when I left college, I, I was already gigging in all these club bands. I had enough work. I had enough teaching. I didn't need to look for a job. I was already doing it, which was great and but I never felt ready to do the pop gig I never felt for some reason I just you know I wasn't very confident as to as to like yeah I'll go down to London and I didn't to be honest I didn't didn't really like London because London was the place where most of it was happening it felt very cold to me and I didn't it didn't really sing to me initially and then and then as it got went on and I was teaching more and I was playing more, the the teaching actually burnt me out a little bit, to be if I'm honest. I, I was I loved it. I loved teaching and I had about I was teaching in one school from nine AM to four PM every day. Thirds with a thirty minute lunch break. And for five days a week, which is kind of unheard of in the UK and it was just one-on-one drum lessons and it was great and I'd, I had a wonderful time doing it and I had a bunch of phenomenal students and the students, some of the students went on to win Young Drum of the Year in the UK, it was a big competition and we submitted them for those competitions and they did great and it opened them up to go on and do phenomenal things. And it got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm feeling ready. When I was sort of mid to late 20s, I was like, I should have done this earlier. I should have really tried to go down to London where the bigger gigs are. And we did some huge gigs, but the more big touring acts, you know. So, and at that time, it was 2011, and uh, I used to be really close to a drum shop in the UK and they were like, hey, we're going to Nam. do you want to come? Like, we could use your help, like, I think you'd enjoy it, just come out and hang out and I was like, yeah, why not? Let's let's give it a go and I booked my flights the week before and we came out to Nam. and and as soon as I landed here, I was like, yeah, this is where I need to be, you know, and I just knew instantly, I was like, this is fantastic. 
So I'll try and keep this story short, but we went to Nam and we were only there. For, I was only here for five days and we, we stayed at Nam for three or four of those days and we came to Santa Monica for one night. And I kind of got the bug. And that night I met my now wife just in the bar. We just got talking and like, all right, lovely. And I met her and, and then I flew home the next day. And we stayed in touch and I was like, yeah, I want to come back and check out LA a bit. And I'd already invited her. I was like, if you're ever in England, I'll show you around. And and she returned the favor. And so she came to see me and I came came back to LA. And it kind of gave me another reason to come to LA. It gave me, uh, initially it just gave me, you know, somebody that I knew that. It gave me a friend, it gave me, you know, and so I could stay with with her, with jill and and we would go on and you know she'd be at work and i'd go out and check out bands and i'd go on and meet people and and that's kind of how it happens and and then three or four years into that it 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 was the time to move i'd, I'd made enough connections here to to get enough work and and allow me to get a visa because that was a whole deal but um but yeah never really when i was younger I was quite content living where I was and and it never kind of, you know, put it on me. But at that time in my life, in, in the, you know, 2010, 2011, I was, I was really looking to either move to London and, you know, ease down the teaching a little bit and then really go for it. Uh, but then the LA opportunity came along and it was, where would you rather be in LA where the sun shines all the time or London where it rains a lot and you have to get round by tube and drag your drum kit on the tube. And it just made more sense, you know, it was just, it just made more sense to come to LA. Wow. So in other words, it's like you met your wife and then that was kind of the, the thing that, that said, well, I'll go for it. Yeah, pretty much, you know, and I think had I not met, my wife it wouldn't have I would have probably come to LA a couple of times you know over the next few years but I would have probably ended up moving to London just because it's closer to home and but yeah it, you know we we did a long distance relationship for three years and and it was in the April of 2013 when I was like I had my visa and I moved here and I'd spent two summers meeting people and I actually joined a signed band out here, which inevitably split up and didn't do anything. Um, but that helped me get across to the U S you know, I had to have a, an all one visa and all this work lined up and, and that kind of enabled me to do that. So, um, going into the NAM, um, uh, situation and, and, um, did you start to get, uh, into the industry a little bit. Um, the, yeah. the, you, you uh, obviously you said you worked at the drum shop and then you came over, which is actually a huge thing to go to Nam and, and come in. For for us, it's 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 kind of like a six hour drive, uh, but for that, it's yeah. like coming over the pond and all that. So, did you feel at that point you started getting involved in the in the industry? Yeah, because. As I say, I used to teach and I used to play a lot, so I had a lot of industry connections with educational endorsements and and artist endorsements for myself. And then with the music, with the drum shop that I, I used to work at when I was 17, I'd obviously stayed in touch with those guys and they were my local drum shop. They're, to me, still one of the best drum shops in the world. You know, if you ever get a chance... Um, and they, I used to do, um, videos for them. So they would, they'd have products they wanted demoing and I'd demo this product. And, and then that kind of led on to, uh, an, an artist endorsement with Istanbul Mehmet. And I would do a lot of videos for Istanbul Mehmet and that's how I got to know them. And when I went to them, I was actually going over with a, with another drum company, which is now no longer, I think it was Shine Drums, and and they'd literally, the, the day we got on the plane to fly to Nam, they were like, yeah, we're not going to be there, we're out of business, and it was kind of sad. 
ball and and you know I was just helping out and I and I already knew it's kind of funny because when I landed here I knew a lot of the reps because all the English reps come across and you know so you you kind of just hang out with all of those guys and it and it was but it it helps solidify those relationships because as we know the industry is all about relationships so um talk about the um uh, Istanbul a little bit and um I don't know the history but apparently what I've learned um is that um Mamet was uh the symbol smith for Zildjian yeah and 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 um uh I think it was um uh, was it Turkey and um um he um was working for Zildjian, and, and I don't know if this is correct, but this is what I heard. Um, Zildjian wouldn't hire him to come over to, to Boston. And so yeah. he, he made his own company, and then um, there was a brother or, or, or a partner, and the partner died, and then the children took over, and then he separated, and that became Agop, and then Mament, so they, they split off. So I don't know if you know the history a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, you pretty, much, you pretty much had a brief, brief description of it right there, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, Mehmet, Mehmet and Degop both, I believe, both worked in the Zildjian factory. Uh, Mehmet definitely worked in there from when he was nine years old, believe it or not. You know, I don't think there's, there was no child labor laws back then. <laughs> um, so he was working in there from, you know, oh, my math's terrible, but it probably is, you know, 60s, early 60s onwards. And then when Zildjian decided to move to the US, I don't think they brought any of the Turkish symbolsmiths apart from anybody that was in the family across. And uh, Mr. Mr. Mehmet was a he was a master craftsman for, for for Zildjian, so he was making you know all the sixty Zildjians that we we kind of fell in love with, uh, you know, and and then when they moved in eighties, they they decided to to form Istanbul Symbols, and it was Mehmet and Agop, and they they're not related; they were just friends, and and then I think it was in ninety four ninety five, Agop died sadly and I think it was a boating accident and and then as you say his family his young sons wanted to take you know wanted to split the company so there was no real love lost or bad blood it was just you know hey we want to do our own thing and so they but nobody wanted to give up the Istanbul logo so that's where you see the same Istanbul logo and you see Mehmet and Agop so it can be confusing but um that, that's that's the the history really you know yeah and what i heard is that um and and i met uh um, i met at the um at the booth at, at nam and yeah. he doesn't speak english at all no very little apparently he he uh made those original k soldiers uh that tony williams played and they had a few of those at the uh at the nam um and um Somebody I went to Berkeley, I went to Berkeley and Boston with is is an endorsement. Him and his son. I don't know if you know Jimmy Daniels. If you met yeah, him, yeah, and you can, yeah, love those guys. Right. So, so Jimmy, I went to school with in the day, um, and and so we were involved together, you know, in 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 everything going on at Berkeley and and in the practice room and Gary Chafee and all these different things. So, so maybe you could talk about what happened there. Uh, about how you came in to finally like get involved and they made you uh, uh artist rep yeah so i'd i'd been um like i said back in the uk i'd been doing videos for them and and involved with their drum shop uk which was their is their distributor in the uk so i'd been you know i'd kind of grown to know them a little bit and then when i moved over here i met uh, Pam originally, so Pam was before David, and um, or kind of in the middle of David. So Pam used to be the distributor, uh, the the lead of the the warehouse over here. And there was Pam, and then after Pam left, there was Manson and David. And so I kind of just 
stayed in touch with, I was in touch with Pam and I was helping to do some videos here and there. And then I went to Nam, and they'd asked me if I could help with social media and um, the website because the UK distributor kind of set up a new website for them and did design this whole website and they knew that I was kind of tech savvy with that thing. So I was like, yeah, I can, I can kind of manage the website and when everything needs uploading or... So I was doing the website and the social media. So that was kind of my first in. And then, um, you know, we'd, we'd go to Nam and I got to know Manton and David, you know, and then it was, you know, I, I don't fully know what went on with Manton, you know, it wasn't really any of my business. And they, they kind of approached me and was like, would you, you know, would you want to do this? And I was like, yeah, like I, I'd be happy to do it, but I, you know, I don't want to take anyone's job away from them. I'm not, you know, if, if, if this is a decision you've made, it's a decision you've made, but once it's done, then come to me in it. And it took, you know, six, seven months before, you know, anything changed. And, and then I came on board and, and it was, you know, it was, I've enjoyed it because I've, you know, I've dealt with artist reps all my life and, and, I'm an artist myself and I, I know what an artist needs and, and, you know, and what, what you can expect and what you shouldn't expect. And, and, and also trying to push those boundaries as well, you know, just to try and, you know, when I came in and this, you know, the Mehmet is, is, we're still a little bit behind the times with everything. And, and we, you know, you know, the, you know, the endorsement days have changed quite a lot from when, you know, it was back in the, even in the 90s and the early 2000s, you know, it's it's not the same, you know, where someone would just give everyone free gear constantly and there was, you know, and then they would pay the money and it's like, that just doesn't happen anymore. You know, the, there's, a, there's a two-way street. So, so, uh, so I kind of came on board and, and it was it was kind of at a really pivotal point within social media as well. You know, F- Facebook was taken off, Instagram was really taken off and that was kind of almost taking over a little bit, you know. there's So it was kind of a good, it's a kind of a good fit to have your social media and your artist relations kind of in one. Um so I just kind of, we started work, I'm working with Bulent. I don't know if you know Bulent, who's the another artist relations for, for Turkey. He's, he does a lot of product development. And we kind of just worked together well, and we, we had similar ideas. And, and I'll just come up with ideas. And I'm like, hey, I think we need to revamp the contracts. I think we need to change this. I think we need to have a different structure. And, and they kind of just ran with it because I didn't, I knew a lot about reps and I, I dealt with reps, but I didn't know a lot about being a rep. So it was kind of, I was learning on the job and, and they've been, you know, I've been connecting with my other industry friends from DW and like Garrison and, and Jules over at DW and, and the guys at Daddario and Pearl. And I'll just ask them questions. And, you know, when I first started doing this, I'd be like, Hey, I've got this job now this is what I think we should be, this is what I think I want to do. And they're like, great, yeah, it sounds absolutely spot on, sounds like you know what you're doing, you know. And they've, they've supported me and helped me out, and DW has been really helpful, you know. They're like, yeah, we've got a bunch of jargon that we can that you can use for, like, legal stuff, and you can look at our contracts and see if it matches up, because everybody, realistically, everybody in the industry wants their contracts to be somewhat level, because at the end of the day, if one company starts just giving loads of stuff out and paying stuff, it doesn't help the rest of the industry and it just tanks it. So it's kind of, you know, we're not, we're not Nike, we're not Adidas and we're not, you know, Adidas and, you know, we're not paying Tiger Woods $3 million, you know, we, it's a different industry. So, um, that was kind of my role and, and, that's kind of what I've been trying to do. You know, it's still, it's still, you know, a struggle and it's still a fight every, every day. We, 
we, you know, we try and promote the brand and we try and bring on the best artists we can. And we try and support them in the best way. And I like to think that I'm, I try and take a bit of a chance on some of the, the up and coming and people who aren't, aren't the Dave Weckles and the Thomas Langs. And because I was never that. And, you know, it, it, it was always nice when someone helped me and, you know, well, sometimes you don't think an endorsement is that helpful. It really can be, and 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 it just helps that person just step up to that next level, even if it's just a morale booster or or, or whatever, you know. And so I feel like I I want to help that type of artist as well as the bigger artist, you know. And I want to be able to give any artist an opportunity, whether it's they're big or small, it's they're all an artist and it's, they're all equal to me. So. Yeah. That you make some really good points. Um, and, um, you know, there was a thing that was on, uh, there, there's some drum, you know, I check out a lot of these, um, videos and, and people doing, you know, uh, almost like they're, they're they're promoting their their drum uh, course and they have a lot of like political things on there and so this one um, YouTuber was talking about uh, oh getting the endorsement and he he talked about like this this is the you know making me feel important you know and um, yeah. but actually in actuality you know they're paying more because. They're paying. There's there's a discount, but they're paying uh, retail, and so the discount on the retail, they could probably get it cheaper if they bought it off of, um, you know, from a, a drum shop or, or or online or something like that. So that was like their um, kind of his argument, and and um, you know, getting into this like I'm cool because I'm an endorsement, and you're you know maybe you're in your twenties or something like that, and it makes you feel good, you know. Uh, but the thing yeah. that, and, and some people comment, and, and, and I'll comment too, people like Garrison, like yourself, um, and the person I was trying to think of, Mark Wessels, uh, I couldn't think of it because my brain went blank. He helped me with my videos. He helped me with all this stuff. And, you know, getting into Vic Firth was not easy, by the way. I, I had to twist their arm. Mm -hmm. and, and finally, even though I've been doing this my whole life, you know, playing drums for 50 years, um, yeah. it was really, really hard. You know, but I finally being persistent, which I am, um, you know, they finally let me in as a teacher's endorsement. But Mark helped me with like getting lighting, you know, getting the um, lav mic, you know, take your mic stands down. Um, try to do this, um, you know, with your videos. Don't don't be concerned about your your dialogue as much. Try to get your point out. Try, don't try to be perfect all the time. Um, put little banners yeah, up yeah. on your and uh, when you're introducing something, put a banner up so you know you, you make it like very clear. So he actually helped me do all this stuff. And there's another there's another drummer that lived here, a colleague who actually now has a, a ALS. I don't know if you ever um, yeah. heard of this, John Exopolius. Uh, he did a bu bunch of drum stuff, and 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 Mark had helped him. And we used to hang out like I I've known him my whole life, and we go over and like give me ideas and whatnot because he'd have like a drum camp like a, a music camp and he did all the online stuff he's got like books you know like four or five books and and just all these he's a great businessman and then he had like a corporate band you know um in the day corporate stuff was working where you do like your each gig would be you know a high-end gig and and um you know you do so many gigs a, a year and he'd probably end up making a million dollars off just the band alone you know so, um, so basically what happened is, um, you know, um, I would say that all these companies help me rather than saying something of, oh, um, you know, I'm trying to get the deal. It's more like they're supporting, you know, it's a support group and they give you ideas. DW help me. It's like, you know, you need this. This is how you set this up. You have questions. Um, something happened to your, like a, a technical issue, you know, we'll fix that. Um, so there's a lot of support there behind the scenes rather than just, I get a free, you know, gear. I get free this, get free that. So, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And I think that's that's one thing that I want to do, you know, because when I was growing up, you know, it's it, I, I did have a lot of support from friends and family, but within the industry, it was, 
as you say, sometimes it can be a closed door, you know, and 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 they're not that interested. And and I and maybe they're not interested because I'm not good enough or I wasn't high profile enough to help them with their company. But I think you know the the people like yeah, like you say, like the DWs and the Garrisons, and it, it's it's that type of thing that I want to create it's a family you you know you we we, we we want to build up at the same time you want to build up and, and and grow together and if I can help you in one way or shape or form I'll do that you know and I want to say one more thing about your company um I I absolutely love the symbols I love them right. to death and 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 yeah. I got like I said that day I went and bought you know as much stuff as I could um you know because that's what I do I, I went big and I just love it. I love, you know, everything that I have. Um, and it's it's just been like, you know, like I said, I just trusted my buddy, you know, uh, uh, Jimmy. And I, I, I went for it and I just, I love it, you know. So it's really been a perfect fit for me. Um, awesome. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of getting into this thing. I'm telling you about doing this, this videos and, and teaching and, and uh, you know, posting stuff online and, and marketing and social media. So I'm, I'm going to get into that now. Um, and that's my, you know, this next step of my life. But, um, you know, I want to really work with you and in, in, in promoting this stuff because it is incredible. And I don't think a lot of people know about it. It's not in the music stores like yeah. a, we say, like a, a you know main endorsements like Zildjian and and Sabian and and Pasty. Yeah. You know they're they're not you know a normal kind of a, it's almost like a boutique kind of symbol company. But yet, you know they cover all styles of music and they're so incredible. And I think Mament, you know, has this thing like he's done this his whole life since he was like you said like ten years old or and it it shows you know. And, and, you know, we are still, we're probably one of the only, I won't say the only, but one of the bigger manufacturers that everything is 100% handmade. You know, there's no machines involved. There's no pressing of the symbols. There's everything is hand hammered. It's put into the oven by hand, you know, and, you know, we, you know, we, we can't make symbols fast enough because of that, but we're happy with that because we don't want to, Mehmet doesn't want to, you know, make it just a mass product, you know, and, and while Zildjian and Serbian make beautiful symbols, you know, they can make sim all of their symbols 100% handmade and that's, that's fine, you know, but we don't, we want to try and keep it just handmade and, and it is, it's a different technique and it's a different Thing. And when you play these symbols, personally, you know, I've played many. I've played Zildjian, I've played Sabian, I've played Agop, I've played Mehmet. It's, they really do speak to me and they, they, they are 100% handmade and, they, and they've got a life of their own when you play them. Each symbol is ever so slightly different because of that, you know? Yeah. So I, I've, I've found that too, that they're, they're very unique and, and uh, amazing. And, um, you know, I think... Uh, as time goes on, I think, you know, people will find out about it. Um, and it's not just for jazz. And a lot of time, what, what we're going through is like jazz symbols are very rare and very hard to find the, the one for you. Um, yeah. People people spend their lifetime trying to get that collection. But I think, you know, the Istanbul just has that, you know, it's, it's there. Like, you don't have to like search forever. It's there. Um, it's just trying to get, be able to, to get the product, you know. Um, yeah. probably have to buy online, which is hard because I know buying symbols is personal and it's hard to buy a symbol online, even though that's kind of yeah. how things went. Um, you just have to take a chance on it. But, um, you know, if you can get to a, a place where you can try them out in person, um, you know, it, it, it does help. And I mean, it's sad that a lot of the music stores these days are, are going out of business, you know, and who knows how that's going to be after the pandemic, you know. So there's the big box stores like Guitar Center and Sweetwater, which are now primarily online, you know. Like, even we have, like, just in LA alone, we have probably five or six or seven or eight large guitar centers, and you can walk into there and be like, hey, I need this product, whether it's drums, guitar, bass, or whatever, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, we don't have it, you'll have to go online. And it's like... Okay, so you end up just buying online because 
they're not stuck in it in the stars. They've got it in their warehouse somewhere. And so it is, it's different. It's a different time. And, um, so yeah, if you, if you can get into a store and there's a, and they have our stuff or you can, you know, anyone's always welcome to the warehouse and to, to try stuff out, whether you're an end user or an artist or a dealer, you know, you're always welcome. And, um, so, but yeah, it's, it's tough, but, you know, we all make good stuff and and it, there's videos out there you can check out. I know they're not the same, but it'll give you the, you know, the idea. Yeah, and I'll do what I try to do is just so I, you know, I might want to do in the live playing. Um, I let people know about it, you know. Yeah. So, so I, I try to do it that way in my in my when I'm playing in public and, and, and whatnot is try to, to, to really uh, let people know about the product and I let students know and, and whatnot, but um, you know um, it is a different time now. So you, <laughs> it's going to, yeah. it's going to change for a while. You know, things are going to change for a while um, until we get back into uh, you know, normal, the normal way of, of going out and performing and, and, and recording and everything. Um, so, um, last question for you. Um, what advice can you give for young musicians that are looking to get started in the music and, and playing music and in the music industry? Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a loaded question there, but I would just say, you know, just enjoy it. You've got to love it. Find something that, find the music that you really enjoy playing. Um, and don't, but don't be afraid to try things outside of your box. You know, don't don't be afraid to try. If you are into pop and you want to try jazz and or try some Latin music, and because you never know what you might find, and put yourself in those situations of, you know, figure my language or oh shit moments, and like I don't know if what I'm doing here. Like this is put yourself in those situations because that's where you're going to learn. You know, you'll have your whiplash moments like we all have, and and you really learn from your mistakes and you learn, you know, learn on the job and just, just give it your best. And as long as you enjoy it and you have fun with it, you will always have fun. There's going to be tough times and there's going to be rough times, but you know, what we do is not really a job. You know, it's, it's something we, we get to love every day and that's, you know, that's a blessing. Great. Hey, Carl, thank you so much for doing this. And, um, you know, it, it's it's really been a pleasure for me to actually uh, talk to you in person because uh, I've talked to yeah, you. Already. And so, um, you know, getting to know about you and, and your life and, you know, like all these great things you've done, you know, it really inspires me. And uh, I think it's going to inspire a lot of other people too. So thank you so much for doing this. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And, you know, anything you need or any students need, just they can just reach out to me. Awesome. Thank you so much for going through this video. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. Be sure to check out my website, robhartdrumstudio.com. And there I've compiled online music courses that I've used with my experience of a lifetime of playing and teaching music that cover counting and reading rhythms, hand and feet technique, groove independence, and much more. Until next time, happy practicing.